Hi, everybody. This is David Fraser here, and I'm so, so excited to be welcoming Mr. Dan Fox on the show today. He's um, got an incredible background. He's the author of several books, but the latest book is called Confessions from the Heart of an Executive Coach. Um, he's also got a really fantastic TED Talk, which is how we originally found him. It's called The Hidden Truth About Human Connection. He did for TEDx um, back in 2015. And I'm just, I'm really enthralled uh, by his story, by um, his mission in life, which is to go and help people connect better. So I thought it'd be a perfect tie into what we do here on the Meaningful Connection podcast. So Dan, thanks for taking the time and thanks for, um, you know, pouring into the show today. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It's an honor to be with you. So I'd love to just dive into your background a little bit. Can you tell us how you found yourself into, you know, executive coaching from the heart. That seems like a almost counterintuitive thing or almost yeah, counterintuitive it, thing almost. It, it, it really is counterintuitive for most people. Uh, most of my clients say, why don't they ever teach this in, 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 uh, in school? Uh, because we don't deal with the emotion in school. We deal with intellect. Um, I, uh, I started out in my life selling advertising and then buying advertising, and then creating advertising, owning an advertising agency, and then um, uh, went into the corporate world in uh, the Silicon Valley area with a vice president of marketing, vice president of sales, and wound up being a CEO of a manufacturing company. When I left there, I wanted to continue to use what I had been learning for 30 years, reading everything I get my hands on about relationships and teams and stuff. So I wound up opening up the, um, the executive coaching company, Unlock Your Leadership, uh, 24, almost 24 years ago. So since then, I've had a chance to coach, like I said, 5,000 VPs um, all over the world. And, and people are the same. They're still people. Yeah, there's social cultural differences, but they're still just human beings. And we have a deep craving, hard DNA, wired, driven desire for human connection, especially with family. Mm -hmm. And if someone is without family, my mom and dad has passed away, no kids, no wife kind of thing. We still have an opportunity to create a really good couple of really great friends that we can create into family and be with them. So, mm -hmm. um, so my, my life is all about helping people transform to create way better uh, relationships through human connection, which gives you everything you want in your life, family. And also, by the way, in the work life, it creates success. When you have a team that knows that you love them. Now that, so there's almost two drives today in, in, in modern life. There's the drive for, I guess, material financial success. And mm -hmm. then that pull or that instinct of the heart of like, I really want to also, I don't want to just trample everybody for the bottom line. I also want to uh, create that love and connection within my family, within my team, whatever it is at the same time. And, and I think they've been set up, to be almost at odds with each other right now. Uh, you, you get what I'm saying? Yeah. And in fact, that's absolutely what you've just said is absolutely uh, correct. And it does not need to be true. The ultimate fact, if you dig deep enough, you realize that they are in perfect alignment, that all of my clients that have called me never have called me and said, I want to be in a better relationship with my team members. I want to uh, create relationship with my board, you know, whatever. It's always about, we want to increase our top line revenue growth 30% quarter over quarter with margin so that we can maximize shareholder value. I want, it's about the money. It's about the money, Dan. And I go, okay, great, super. That's exactly what I can help you do. Right. And, and we'll do that through the bonding of a team, higher levels of trust, being vulnerable so that they open up and speak the truth to you. So it's all about the human connection and relationship stuff that's going to give you a team that commits to outcomes as opposed to hopefully wanting to try to do my best to see if we can succeed. So they are hand in hand, perfectly aligned that when we get really good at relationships, we close more clients. We hire more people, better people. We create more of a team. So they're in perfect alignment. We just, they call me because of money and I help them with their personal growth. And then they wind up getting the money. That makes sense. And, and I can see the opposite being true as well. If you make the shortcuts on the personal front uh, with, your, with your team, with your friends, with your family, uh, mm -hmm. then that actually net, the negative effect of that is you're going to have more distrust. Um, and if you're talking about it in a business context, you're going to have it's going to spill out to the customers. It's going to spill out to the bottom line ultimately. Right. Yeah. 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 I mean, if you, uh, if you, if you do that, if you go just for the money kind of thing, then yeah. your team will look at you as themselves as being a pawn on your chessboard that you're moving around. So you get what you want and they don't want to trust you in that event. They don't want to go stretch, go across five miles of hot coals barefooted to help you get, you know, the team success. So yeah, it doesn't, 
it just doesn't work. Yep. So, so obviously our audience is primarily like families and, and people that uh, they, they want to take that deeper level with their, their, the loved ones, friends and family in their life. Yeah. What, how do you think um, the, the business context that are, as we're talking about built, like the, just the practical aspects of building a team, how would that apply in a family context? Oh, yes. Fantastic. Um, everyone has an ego. I don't mean the super ego like pride and arrogance, but I mean an ego called my self-identity. And the ego that's inside every single one of us is, is always continually saying, all I want to do is to help you avoid pain. I want to help you avoid pain. So play it safe. Play it safe. Should I go out and risk uh, sharing this vulnerable conversation with a family member? Should I cop to something that I did wrong and own it? Should I, uh, should I apologize? Ego says, no, 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 don't go do that. You know what? They'll jump on that and they'll use that against you. So don't just keep quiet. Just stuff your emotions. Just smile when you see them. Give them a little bro hug with a pat on the back and sit down and visit and ask them how their kids are doing and how their work life is doing and keep it shallow because shallow means safe. The egos drive us to do that. However, the, the, the subconscious mind, the heart is screaming and saying, no, I want more. I want to be in deep, transforming relationship with these people. I want to be moved by them and I want to move them. I want to be close. I want to be able to have a relationship so tight with them that if things go wrong in my life and being life, it sometimes does, I can go to them. I can lean on them. I can cry or I can say, man, I just don't know what to do. I need help. I just want you to walk alongside me through this. And people love you enough. They go, oh, I'll be happy to do that. As opposed to, hey, it's going to be okay. Don't worry about it. Goodbye. You know, yeah. Well, so <laughs> I'm thinking of my own family when you're saying this, right? I'm thinking of my, my immediate core family, and then I'm thinking of my extended family and kind of the environment that I grew up in. And I don't think I'm alone, probably, in this sense of like there are certain topics, there are certain depths of emotion that are kind of like we don't talk about that, or we we yeah. don't, uh, you know, we keep that on the superficial level, right? Yeah. So if that's kind of let's say, you know, your pre-programming or what you were raised into, what are some practical ways we can kind of break through that ice? You know, how do we, or, or I guess change that momentum, if you will. Yeah, that's great. <clears throat> we ease into it. We don't okay. just jump like crazy. We ease into it. And the, the, the key element of actionable you can take and do is to, um, to come to a place where you say, <clears throat> I am willing to become vulnerable. I, I know that I'm a good human being. I, I fail and I miss the mark all the time, like other, every other human beings are. I realize that I'm a flawed human being. And I also realize that everyone else is a flawed human being too. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm going to be vulnerable. I'm going to share my feeling. If I say, hey, let's talk about what happened 12 years ago in our family. You know, that's like scary. They'll run for the hills. But yeah. if you say, I've really been feeling uh, sad lately. And they go, oh, really? Why is that? And you go, well, I just feel I'm missing. I, I guess I feel like there. I'd like to be close. And I think that sometimes our past emotional baggage kind of gets in the way for us opening up and connecting with one another, you know. And so I'm leaning toward I'm being vulnerable. Not it's not what I said. It's how I'm saying it. I'm being vulnerable. And there's one thing you need to know about vulnerability. And I and I have to give credit to Dr. Uh, Brene Brown, which led with this. And that is. Uh, vulnerability is contagious. So if I begin to become vulnerable with you in, in small ways and open up my heart to you in small ways, it's contagious. You will automatically want to become a little more vulnerable with me. And now we start to expanding into the world of being able to be open, honest, transparent, authentic with each other even more and more and more and more. And we soon wake up and realize that, wow, I can tell them anything and they don't judge me. And they're, and they're now telling me everything and I'm not judging them. Um, there's no payoff for judgment. I get to be right. Well, right. I get to be right because I'm judging you is equals human separation from others. You know, if you want to do that, okay, fine. Yeah. I'm, right. <laughs> I'm always reminded of that internet meme of, uh, you know, the husband that's like frantically typing on the keyboard at two in the morning and the wife's like, come on, let's go to bed, uh, John. And he's like, no, no, someone's still wrong on the internet, <laughs> you know? Uh -huh. And it's yeah. a never ending battle to, to right all of the intellectual wrongs out there, especially on the internet. Oh, um, yeah. and, and it's, it does, it's just instantly separates people. As soon as it's like, you're wrong and here's why, da, 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 right. It yeah. can just separate, you know, whereas if you say, if you lead with a feeling or like a, a statement, like, Hey, I'm really feeling that, you know, there's a less of a, 
objective fact statement and more like I'm subjectively feeling, feeling this emotion. It may be wrong. It might be right. I don't know, you know, but that's what yeah. I'm feeling. And no one can ever dispute that you're feeling something in general. No, ac- actions can be right or wrong. Words can be right or wrong. Feelings cannot be right or wrong. Feelings just are. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now here's a question that I ask my clients or whatever you, you want to judge others because you're right and they're wrong and the way they're looking at things or whatever. Do you want to be right? Or would you rather win? Because you can be right and get a pound of flesh, but you don't win because you're hardwired for human connection and judging others and holding a resentment and telling them how they're wrong will create separation. We don't do well alone. I mean, you look at uh, an individual, Ted Kaczynski, the Unabomber alone. When we're completely alone, it doesn't go well. Right. Most of the people who have ever committed violent crimes that we do, they, the research shows when they interview them, they found that they were, quote unquote, a lone wolf, isolating. We don't do well isolating. Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're dogs. We're not cats. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Um, so, you know, I, I can just picture that applying the concept of, of prioritizing winning together versus being right in the family. That seems like such a, yeah. uh, a powerful frame of reference or frame of, of looking at things. Um, I think yeah. of it just like an, I probably feel example <laughs> that, uh, that I can bring from uh, So we homeschool our daughter who's seven now. And, uh, there's a, there's a, some days when she just does not want to get school done. And so it can often become this battle of like, you know, come on, it's the right thing to do. You got to do this, you know, blah, and we do that versus, you know, I think reframing that as like, how can we win together? How can we get a win out of this together? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I yeah, think to be, able to, to be able to sit down and say with her, listen here, honey, I want you to know that there are days that, that all of us, there are individual days where we don't feel like doing the work. Can mm-hmm. you please take a moment and tell me what's going on with you? Why is it today that you don't feel like doing your homework or doing your classwork? You know that you need an education. We have to have an education and we have to do the school work. But I'm going to ask you right now today, why is it that today you feel like not doing it? Is it because you're tired, you didn't sleep well or what? I'm going to show my daughter that I deeply care about her feelings. And after she has expressed herself to me and got it off her chest or she knows that I understand, I can say, I get that. Okay, but here's the deal. We still have to do our homework. So what can we do? Let's let's get started and let's still do that thing that often we don't want to do called our schoolwork today. Let's get busy. Let's go. But mm-hmm. she feels like she's had some compassion and understanding from you that you know that it's hard for her to engage in schoolwork again right now, but we're still going to go do it as yeah. opposed to. I don't hear your communication. I'm not going to come over in your side and walk in your moccasins and feel what you're feeling right now. Let's just get busy and do our work. That yep. means I, you don't care about me. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it, it's subtle, but it does make a big difference of how the, it feels as well. Yeah. There was a moment in time. Uh, I'm going to share this just for a second. It's, you'll see it in the TED Talk when you go to YouTube and type in Dan Fox in the search box. But um, relationships and human connection can occur Um, almost instantaneously, rarely, but they can occur. Um, There's a man named Dr. Leo Buscaglia, B-U-S-C-A-G-L-I-A, who was a USC professor, wrote uh, uh, 14 books, five of them on the New York Times bestseller list at one time, um, on every talk show back in the 70s or 80s about coming from love. There's a long story about that, but just a a rock star guy back then. And uh, I run across him at Lake Tahoe outside at a festival. I see him, I recognize him. And I say, I've got to meet him. And I walked over and I introduced myself and he turned and faced me. He's di- he was nicknamed Dr. Love at uh, USC. He takes my hand, pulls me in, and he grabs me and hugs me, both arms all the way around me and tucks his head into the crook of my neck like I'm coming home from the war, you know, and yeah. holds me for like two seconds and then pulls away and his hands go down to my elbows and he's still hanging on. And he looked me in the eye and I'm a nobody. I am a nobody to him but he holds my hand and he says dan it is so great to finally meet you what an incredibly stupid statement but if you looked in his eyes you got it he meant it yeah he meant it and it just transformed and moved me to where wow i matter to this guy and over the course of 10 minutes or whatever i i wound up getting the incredible power and the depth of of coming from love being open risking and vulnerable reaching out and connecting, getting off myself and focusing on you, you know, 
rather than being, I'm, I'm running in the background, wondering what's going on, what's going to benefit me. I can think about you and yep. come from love, how it, how it, it transformed my whole business. And it transformed a lot of my personal relationships about vulnerability. Yeah. So we can happen. It can happen quickly if we're willing to be outrageously loving uh, and, and caring and giving that puts us at risk for the pain of being shunned or disappointed or being judged. Yeah, or, it does. Yeah. Or in some cases being ripped off too, because I think when you're, when you're vulnerable and when, when you're out there with people, um, <laughs> it does, it puts you in a position where you can get ripped off, you know? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'm going to have, I'm going to have, I'm going to have a yellow flag in the back of my mind right now. I'm going to say, I'm going to be reading the situation in the moment and I'm going to be discovering whether you're embracing what I'm saying or doing. Yep. Or whether you're resisting it. And if you're resisting it, I'm going to back right off and go, hey, that's great. It's really good to see you. How are you today? I'll back right off. Yep. But I'm going to lead with that to see if there's an opening there with this individual. Yeah, I, th- I think a, a good a good moral principle is treat everyone as, as loving and as best as you possibly can the first time. Right. And then ultimately the ball's then in their court to respond and how they, you know, how they're going to go about that. So. Yeah. And yeah. we don't take responsibility for how they're going to respond. Often they won't, they won't respond positively, but it's okay. What if once every five people you meet just open up and you become best friends? My goodness, what a rich life. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. So let's say you've got the, the person in your life and for whatever reason, you've got some history with them and you have, you don't have that instant connection, um, uh-huh. but you, you know, they're your brother, they're your brother-in-law, they're your father. Yeah. Like, you know, what, what are some practical things that you would suggest of how we can break the ice or just move it in the right direction? Yeah. The first thing I would do is it always success is an inside job with relationships. It starts inside me. It starts inside here. So I get to take a quick look for a moment about my brother-in-law or whatever and say, okay, cool. Do, am I in any way responsible for creating this lack of deep depth relationship that's going on with him? I'm going to start with me rather than going to the story about him being wrong or whatever. I'm going to say, how can I show up differently? What stands in the way? What, if anything, have I done that I get to take a moment and cop to and say, hey, by the way, Phil, you know, we see each other again, whatever. I was just thinking the other day about, you know, seven years ago when this and this happened or whatever. And he's like, oh, yeah. And you go, I just want to tell you how sorry I am for what I did. Now, that Phil might be 80 percent wrong and I'm only 20 percent wrong in the event. But I'm going to own my 20%. I'm going to say, I'm really sorry for me responding the way that I did. It's just kind of bothered me a little bit. And I just want to apologize to you. I'm sorry. Mm-hmm. Period. Yeah. Now all of a sudden, you've removed the right for him to continually blame you because you've apologized and asked for forgiveness. And so he's focused and faced with his stuff, his part in the matter. Yeah. And 90% of the time, he'll say, well, it's not all you. I could have handled this differently myself. I shouldn't have, and I shouldn't have, and I shouldn't have. And you go, okay, cool, great. And so now when the resentments are gone, the stories about how the other person's wrong and judging them, when that gets removed some, then vulnerability starts to show up and human connection automatically begins to occur more and more and more and more. So for me, it starts with me to own my stuff. And if I didn't do anything wrong at all in my life, I can't think of anything that I could cop to it's just them. Then, then two, I can say, here's the deal. I know that we're not super close, but I just want you to know how much I care about you. And I'll always be here for you. Your family, call me, I'll show up for you. Okay. And that moves them, even though they're not going to give you a visual sign of that, you know, like, Oh, thank you so much. No, maybe they just have a lot of emotional wounds and emotional baggage of their past that has clouded their view of relationships that it's not safe at all to open up to anyone. And so they might just be really wounded and hurt. And so I get to have compassion and see them as a wounded and hurt human being who at the core is just like me, still wanting to do right, still wanting to be loved and accepted, just so, um, so hurt that they can't show up today that way. But we never know, you know, two years from now, they may call out of the clear blue and go, you're the only one in the world that I think I can talk to. The only one that still loves me for me being a porcupine. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So to your first point about, about, you know, see, seeking forgiveness first, I, the best piece of marriage advice I got when I was just got married was mm-hmm. uh, the more mature person will seek forgiveness first. Right. <laughs> and so uh, if both you and your wife practice that principle, then um, it puts you in a position where uh, seeking forgiveness isn't this like, position of weakness it's it's like oh i'm you know i'm more mature right it's a little yeah. bit of a big joke but it it does help because that initiation of i was wrong here and t- owning your 20 percent, or everyone views their wrong as generally 20 percent of the wrong yeah. <laughs> where probably the the truth is somewhere in the middle 
but um, it, it opens up the dialogue of like, okay, it's okay to be wrong. It's okay. Or it's okay to yeah. be, you know, it's okay to, to be imperfect. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I can't clean up their side of the street. I can only clean up my side. So I'm not going to judge them for their side of the street. I'm just going to, I'm just going to clean up mine. Yeah. Um, uh, there's something up, there's something moving and powerful about authentically and genuinely loving another person and love. Now, if we think about it just for a moment in the family relationship, especially love is only love when it's unconditional. If I said to you, David, you and I are about to become best friends over the course of our lifetime right now. And I just want you to know I'm going to love you, but I expect you to love me back. And I'm going to do things for you, favors for you, but I expect you to do favors for me. Guess what? That's an unspoken contract I wrote that I forgot to tell you about. That's not love. Yeah. Love is only love when I say, how can I be a contribution to you? And I expect nothing in return. That's moving. Mm -hmm. So we can drop our expectations of our family member or whatever. We can, we can drop our expectations of how they're going to react, what they're going to say. They need to do 50% of the work to create a close relationship with me in my bunky life house. No, they don't have to do anything. I'm just going to love them because they're family or because they're a best friend. I'm just going to love them. They can do or say anything they want to. Now I have boundaries. If I love you and you come out and lie about me or attack me or, or whatever, I'll say, God be with you. Go, go your way. You know, don't, you know, don't go away, Matt. Just go away. You know, it's, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. but at the same time, we're not a doormat. We, we put up protection alerts in the back of our minds. Or if I say something to you, like, you know, you're my brother-in-law, David, I just want to tell you how much I appreciate you, man. And I know we haven't been close or we've had some issues in the past and I just feel bad about that or whatever. And if you respond to something like, yeah, cause you were a jerk back then and you're, you know, and you, and I just can't let you in and blah, blah, blah. I go, Hey, look, here's the deal. My, my bringing this up was not to cause further conflict. It was to try to heal. I'm so sorry that I brought that up. Let's just drop this. Okay. Cause I can tell that it, it's not taking you to a place that serves you. So I can lovingly shut this down and to protect myself or protect my family. But I'm always going to come from a place of love. And maybe three months from now, you, you, it moved you and you noodle on it. And you say, God, he was reaching out to me and he was trying to connect with me. And I do DNA. I, I, I want that. But I responded kind of negatively. Maybe he'll come back and say, hey, I'm sorry. The, you know, last time we got together, I was having a really bad day. And, and I just kind of like went off and, and whatever. I'm really sorry. And you go, no problem. It's fine. You know, I see us, you and I, before I met you, I see you as a seven-year-old boy and I'm a seven-year-old boy. And both of us want to be picked for the team. Both of us want to be loved by our mom and dad. Both of us want to do right and do good. We don't ever, we don't ever put on uh, robes and say, I'm going to be a, ma a bank robber. We put on robes and say, I want to be the Lone Ranger. I want to be Superman. I want to do good. I want to save the world. Our heart, basic, our heart is wanting to be a contribution and be loved and respected and to do good. And so I look at you and say, that's the human being that you truly are deep inside. I don't know what's happened to you to cause you to um, be resentful or hurt or wounded or angry or whatever, but that's okay. I could, as a, as a friend or as a coach, maybe I could be with you in a way you can have that come up and we can clear on that, but that's not my job. My job is just to love you for who you are. And it could move you enough to where you let go of the resentment or the anger or the pain or the frustration or the wounds enough, because I'm the only one in his world that's reached out and wanted to connect. And he's desperately seeking someone to connect to. And so they're people who are hungry for connection because they are a porcupine and nobody wants to get close to them. And you're the only one that's shown an interest in doing that. You can be the one to, as a catalyst to greatly improve their life. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And, and sometimes when people push back the most is when they need you the most, ultimately. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. What an incredible, uh, uh, I, I love the idea of Bunky Life where you create a space that's undistracted, you know, no TV blaring. You can leave your cell phone in the house. You go out to the, to the, the Bunky Life house and uh, with a friend, with a family member or whatever. And you can, you're automatically, I love the fact you're automatically placing yourself in close proximity to another human being. It's not like you and I are talking 12 feet apart uh, across the living room. It changes everything when you and I are two and a half, three feet apart and we're right in close proximity to each other. That creates human connection mm -hmm. to where 
I can reach over and I can touch your arm and I can say, man, David, you know, I, I don't know what to say about that. I'm so sorry. I'll walk through this with you. It puts us in the same, literally the same place in close proximity and connection to one another. And it's yep. isolated, you know, so it's a, uh, it's a great, uh, a great tool for improving mm-hmm. relationship and creating connection. I'd like to take a short sponsor break to tell you about the company I founded, Bunky Life. What we're famous for are small log cabin kits called Bunkies that can be easily built in a weekend without needing a permit or a second mortgage. I've also authored the book, Bunky Life Extra Space. Ultimately, we're in the business of helping families create extra space for more meaningful connection. And you can find out more at BunkyLife.com. To see if your family might be ready for the Bunky Life, take the free five-minute quiz at BunkyLife.com slash quiz. That's B-U-N-K-I-E-L-I-F-E dot com slash quiz. And now back to the show. That's like the Meaningful Connection podcast kind of sprung out of me really deeply thinking about what what ultimate emotional itch are we trying to scratch when we buy a bunkie or when we get, you know, a cottage, right? Um, Right. A lot of that is is I need a space where, you know, it's just about the family. It's just about us getting together, being together. You know, generally, um, I don't know what it's like in California, but here in Ontario, your cottage is kind of like this, like kind of second house that's usually like not air conditioner. It's usually like, you know, kind of the, a, a pretty kind of, you know, rustic at the at, we'll put yeah. it the rustic experience. And, and you're going there not because it's nicer than your current house generally, um, although that's not always the case, but in general, it's, it's a, it's an escape where you're kind of going to this beat up old shack uh, for the sole purpose of getting away, turning off the distractions and just like, it's about the family. Yeah, no, I love that. Uh, it's a place to get away. The noise of the world is so loud. We can't be alone with ourselves for a moment and get clear about what we want, clear about who we are and clear about what stands in the way of us getting what we want. The, you know, in the, in the old days, I'm an older guy. So I grew up in a, uh, uh, for a couple of years on our farm in Arkansas. We had a, a phone on the wall that was a party line phone. We had a TV with three black and white channels, ABC, CBS, and NBC. We had no cell phone. We had no fax. We had no beepers. We had no, you know, nothing. And mm-hmm. so we, we had the opportunity, because there was nothing else to do, to be with each other. We ate every meal together around the table, you know? And so uh, the noise is so profoundly loud. We can't even understand who we are or what we want because there's so much distraction going on. And that becomes a wonderful thing for people to say, I don't have to face me. I don't have to look at me. I don't have to see what's going on with me. I can keep myself completely distracted with things and communication. And how many likes did I get on Facebook? Because every time I get a like on Facebook, it hits me a, a hit of dopamine, a feel yeah. good thing. It's I, was thinking, I was thinking about dopamine and, ox- and um, oxytocin. Or, um, oxytocin? Uh, yeah, oxytocin. I was thinking about those two bond and how um, much, just the way modernity has evolved, we're, we're prioritizing quick dopamine hits over the bonding chemical, which is oxytocin, right? And right. the bonding chemical is that feeling of well-being and that feeling of connection. Really, that's that's a, a big part of it. And not that these are necessarily, you know, these systems both exist in the bodies for reasons. Um, if we're going for dopamine at the expense of long-term bonding and oxytocin, um, uh-huh. you get addicted to this, it's 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 not ultimately healthy. And, and you look at, um, you know, I, I just think of this past year, especially like it's, it's, it's been a real deliberate challenge. We have to be deliberately choosing not to get sucked into whatever the news cycle is or whatever the, um, you know, mm-hmm. fight or, or pleasure of the day is on your phone. Cause it's just so easy to, to get that. And, and, and as a parent, um, you know, of three small kids, they, they have an instant access if they want to their iPad and there's a little dopamine hit there. And right. to try to explain that to our kids um, that, hey, you know, ultimately um, that's fine, you know, to, to, to play a little bit of a game here and there or watch a little thing. That's fine. That's part of that's part of modern life. And at the same time, we don't want you to lose sight of like, you know, the real satisfaction and joy in life is ultimately going to be in our our relationships with our, our family. <laughs> and, and right. you know, I get to I get to live it again because as a kid I was I'm a little younger than you right so as a kid I was I was kind of growing up and I got to see the internet come online I got to see um cell phones I was you know I was 22 and cell phones um, (laughs) started becoming ubiquitous and I was forced to get one um Mm -hmm. so I got to see that 
right? I got to observe <laughs> that and, and, and watch the change and kind of monitor the change for myself. Whereas mm-hmm. kids today, they're just born into it. And it's like they're, mm-hmm. all, they're already pre-plugged into the matrix to a certain extent. And so you have to say, here's the plug and you can choose to plug yourself in or not, but um, you know, it's, it's really a lot different. And, and so my thinking is that there's going to be, have to be a more deliberate and, and conscious effort to be like, okay, here's dopamine. That's what that's like. Experience that and understand that as best you can. And at the same time, here's bonding, here's oxytocin, and here's, um, you know, what life and meaning ultimately is going to come from, which is that bonding and that real connection with each other. Yes. I mean, I, I, t- I totally get what you're saying. You're absolutely right. In my opinion, absolutely. To be able to say to a child, look, okay, here's your cell phone and try to not spend a lot of time on it. Even though dopamine from a Facebook like is addictive, please don't become addicted. That's not responsible for us as adults. I mean, it, I mean, literally along the same line, the insane uh, alternative would be to say, I can see that you're feeling a little depressed today, Sally. You're only six years old. I can see that you're a little depressed today and you want to feel better here. Here's a large glass of whiskey. It'll make you feel better. I mean, wait, right. what? No, we would never think of doing that. Yep. So we also get to unplug the phone and say, look, here's the deal. You see it as me taking away something that you're already having an attraction and an addiction to. I want you to know I'm not taking it away from you as a punishment. I'm wanting to personally connect with you for an hour tonight over dinner. So we're going to put the phone away. Mm-hmm. And there's no, there's no discussion about it. And say, I know that right now in the first five or 10 minutes of sitting down, you're still resenting me for having taken the phone away. Because Mm -hmm. in this moment, you're not experiencing hits of dopamine from me because you're so angry. That's okay. I love you so much. I just want you to know how proud I am of you as a human being. You have a good heart. And so I can actually pour into her and give her hits of dopamine, which replaces what she's missing in the phone Mm -hmm. over dinner. Yep. Rather than me sitting there and being resentful for her, for having taken the phone away, her blaming me, and now she's upset with me. And so I'm not going to reach out to her. I'm just going to make her obey and sit there. Yep. Well, there's no replacement of dopamine there. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that, um, I mean, you think about, we've kind of articulated, a, it's a very simplified version of the science, obviously, right? But I think directionally, this is correct. And you know that the people designing the algorithms for Facebook have a very good handle on that, right? So they're very aware uh, I mean, same thing with all the social media platforms, the same thing with the news. I mean, this is not, this isn't like social media is maybe the most purest cocaine, but mm-hmm. um, you know, this has been dripping out for probably well before our time. Yes. And so they're aware of that. They're creating this, they're, they're consciously aware of this. And so as parents, if we want to instill a healthy balance of, of <laughs> taking hits of dopamine and, and bonding and, we have to be as, as conscious and as deliberate as they are, in my opinion, right? To, yeah. to get a balanced view of, of, of yeah. yeah. Yeah, from the beginning of the day until the end of the night, the, our, our children especially are bombarded with uh, music and TV. And um, that's why they call a, a, a television show programming. It's programming. <laughs> yes. Oh, by the way, they use a channel to do it. Yeah. <laughs> Turn to this channel to get your programming, you know? So um, from social media, Facebook, uh, Twitter, uh, everything. Even just, um, even just the little kitty video, video games on the iPad. I mean, they're, they're scientifically designed for this maximum addiction. Yeah. 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 And so the ultimate question we come down to is this, is it okay for me to let the world raise my child because they're wanting to, and they're currently doing it. And I may only get an hour at the end of the day, after I get home from work, to be able to disconnect everything and have a have a say in raising my child, mm-hmm. I, I I I don't want to let. I love my child so much. I don't want to leave their upbringing to teachers and school and the textbooks and social media and uh, TV and programming. And I'm just going to turn it turn my child's future and their attitudes to everything. I'm going to turn it over to them. I, it's not okay with me. Mm-hmm. I don't want to. Yeah. That. And that's, that's, that's one of the main reasons we homeschool. That's one of the main reasons we're I, having these type of conversations. Cause I'm learning so much from talking to people that have been down the track a little further than myself. And yeah. I've, I've thought about this stuff because I, I think the default is kind of just, you just swim in the ocean that you're born into. And, and, and the, the, the general idea is like, you know, as a fish, you just don't recognize water because you're just in water. And yeah, that general kind of stream that we've been swimming down as North Americans for sure. Um, 
has been mm-hmm. just, you know, we're just kind of passively letting these things, like you say, almost basically raise our children. And, um, right. you know, if you like that result, great, maybe just keep going with it. But personally, I want to at least give my children an option of like, Hey, you don't have to swim with that current. There's a, there's another way to look at things. And there's a, a perspective that I think ultimately, um, you know, it might not be the world's version of success per se, mm-hmm. but, mm-hmm. Uh, but it's a well, more, more re- well-rounded and better connected version of, of the future that is possible. Yeah. And then yeah. they can well, decisions. I mean, yeah. For each, for each individual, all they can, uh, they can do this. They can say, um, uh, if I look at what the society and our culture and families and a sense of peace um, in the in the 50s, 60s, there was a, 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 a very large priority placed upon the nuclear family. It's really, really, really important and cool to have a husband and a wife, a mother and a father in the home with the children. Mm-hmm. And uh, now it's been absolutely OK uh, for us to have a child out of wedlock. And for us to, uh, the father's gone, but the mother's raising him. It's absolutely okay. And then you look at what's going on in our cities with regard to riots and, uh, and protests and violence. I think that there's a direct correlation of the loss of nuclear family and it's showing up in the world and our society with watching what's going on in the news right now. And so we do have a choice to say, I'm going to, I'm going to stop this with my family. I'm going to stop this right now. I'm going to pour into my family. I'm going to make an investment in my family in creating relationship. And yeah, it's going to be abnormal because I, as an adult, am losing my social media opportunity to get a Facebook like, you know, so what? We actually have the opportunity to change our world. The nucleus of our world is husband uh, and, and wife and children, family. I can have an impact there. And if we all choose to, to place love and connection on our nuclear family, then we can start changing our, our town, our county, our state, and we ultimately can change the world. Uh, it's, it's just by you having a loving, close family makes a difference in the world. It really does. <clears throat> well, yeah, it's a beautiful picture and, and it makes complete sense. Um, yeah. I mean, I think so many of the people out there that I think rightfully look at the world and see there's so many problems, there's so much dysfunction. They say, I want to go and change the world as, as if that's even possible. But as, as everyone knows, and it's almost a cliche at this point, like change is going to start right here. Um, yeah. Ultimately it's going to emanate from bottom up. It's not going to come from top down. Yes. Yes. <coughs> success in your home, success in your family, success in your business, success in your community <coughs> is an inside job. It's a place you come from. It's not a place you get to. We start here yeah, and it shows up and it moves and it moves small pieces of the world. <clears throat> there are those exceptions who have been remarkable and fantastic. Martin Luther King, Mahatma Gandhi that have uh, single-handedly pretty much been responsible for doing major social change. I would love it if I had the opportunity to be that and do that, but I have no expectation of that. All yeah. I can do yeah. is I'm going to change my world, my immediate yeah. world. And, and some, some of, the, of those Figures I won't name names, but some of those figures actually have a disastrous personal life going on. Um, oh, and, yeah. and actually, in most cases, I'm, I'm not surprised when I find that that is the case. So it's almost like they've sacrificed uh, the foundation to try to build um, the, the social edifice. And yeah. they, may, they may or may not have had success. We may not remember these people's names. But one thing we do know is that their kids and their grandkids, and they're going to have a very different perspective on, on that. And that, you know, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So what's important to you, Bill, Phil, Sally, George, what's important to you? Is it family or is it getting a Ferrari? Be careful what you choose because you'll get it at the cost of something else. Yeah. What's important? What is really important to you? I've unfortunately known of several people I've coached over the years for financial success who become multi, multi, multi millionaires or whatever, and are uh, driving their Ferrari, living in a townhouse while their wife and children live in a mansion on the hill. And it's like, really? And then the idea is, well, I'll have to find another distraction now to keep me busy. Another affair, uh, drugs, alcohol, gambling, something. There's two, over 212 step programs in the world. So overeating, shopping, you know, whatever. So uh, if we're not careful, we'll continue to bury and stuff our pain and continue to distract ourselves with lots of opportunities for distraction and never feel whole and complete or a sense of peace, a sense of I actually like me. You know, I'm a flawed human being, but I, I generally like me. 
No, they they have to keep running. Yeah, and it's yeah. sad. It just it, I know I don't judge them. It just it hurts my heart to see them in that place, and I have no control over others, only me. So I'm not going to go about trying to fix them. I'm just going to love on them and be available to help. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So this has been a great conversation, and um, I I wonder if you were to to kind of wrap up the conversation and just ex- communicate to the audience. You know what is what is the most significant thing they can personally do to take a step towards more meaningful connection. What would your advice be? Since love is unconditional, if I want love and connection, the, the, the keys to human connection and relationship is going to come from love. And since love is unconditional, love means I'm going to come uh, toward you offering my love, my help, my friendship, my whatever, expecting nothing in return. In order for me to do that, I have to be whole and complete with me. I can't come at this saying, I have desperate deep needs myself for this and this and this. And so I'm going to approach you to get what I want because I'm thinking about me. The key is for me to become whole and complete about me where I can, I can enter this conversation with you and say, I don't really need anything from you. How can I pour into you? And when I do that, I get human connection and relationship, but I need to be free from my emotional baggage of wounds. So do I, am I carrying resentments? Can I forgive them even if they don't deserve it? Because I'm gonna forgive them for my sake. Can I stop myself from judging others, wanting to be righteously right about how they're wrong? Can I drop that? Can I say, I'm just going to be whole and complete and not need to be right about how they are wrong. It starts inside. So free yourself from your emotional baggage. Get help or ask for forgiveness. Cop to your stuff. Forgive others, even if they don't deserve it, because you're doing it so you can be free, not because they deserve it. Forgive them. Make a decision. Pray about it. Forgive them so you can be free. And you wake up feeling whole and complete, not needing anything from anyone, but deeply longing and desiring human connection and relationship because we're hardwired for it. And so now I can go about being um, a contribution to others. I can get off of me. I'm not woo. I'm not hurt. I can get off of me and I can, I can show up for you. And then the world comes racing to you as a magnet, wanting to be a part of your life because they, they're getting unconditional love from you. And that's what they all crave. They want to matter. So if I can get off of me so I can focus on you, I give you what I know genetically you want. And that is to be loved, respected, and to matter. And magically, that's where joy exists. It really crazy... It really is better to give than to receive. I'm also thinking about the, the idea of the first shall be last and the last shall be first. If you go and try to set yourself right at the front of the table um, and it just, it's not going to have that same <laughs> connection as like humbly being like, you know, how can I serve today? How can I put myself at the end of the line? You know, it just, it's going to have a, a way stronger impact on other people. It's a paradox. It's an oxymoron to say I'm hurting today. And I want to be respected and I want to be liked, um, but I'm afraid I won't be. But I'm going to go out there and I'm going to put myself out there and show a little bit of uh, I want to be in connection with you because I want what I want. And um, it, it doesn't work. And so if you say to them, hey, get off yourself and focus on others and you'll find what you're really looking for, or whatever, it seems counterintuitive. I've got so much pain. I have to focus on me. Oh, well, then you're how long? How many decades have you been doing that? How's it working out for you? Yeah. Yeah, I've had a, uh, I've had a couple of clients over the years that I get in a relationship with, and they're like, I say, you know, this paradox, this oxymoron of get, of focusing on the team, not on what you want, show up for them. You can have goals, dreams, and desires, and lead the team toward accomplishing that, but focus on them. And it's like, well, Dan, I understand that, but what they're getting paid, they ought to be doing this, and they ought to be doing that. And I go, oh, okay, all right, great, yeah, yeah. So, uh, look, it's your money, soon to be mine, in this coaching environment. What do you want to talk about then? Cause it sounds like you already got it wired and then they laugh and go, okay, all right. What do I got to see? <laughs> yeah. yeah that makes sense. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, it's been, Dan, it's been such a, a, a an enlightening conversation for me and I hope it was enjoyable for you as well. Um, I just like to reiterate uh, it's Dan Fox with two X's F O X X. Um, check out the hidden truth about human connection. It's a free YouTube talk. 
And um, the book, if you're an executive, it makes a lot of sense. But is, is the, so the book's called Confessions from the Heart of an Executive Coach. Is this something that you'd recommend to a general purpose audience or is it more for people in a kind of business leadership context? The general purpose audience. Okay. And, and 90, 90% of it is about human relationship, forgiveness, getting rid of resentments, how to do the work of getting clear and clean with me so I can show up being a loving contribution to others so that I get the love that I actually want. It's about the steps of how to actually go and do that. Yeah. Uh, so no, totally appropriate for yeah. you know any human being. That's great because I noticed there's um, we've been interviewing a lot of people that are kind of more they've geared their business they've geared their life around coaching business or, or it's a business context, mm-hmm. but, but the principles are so applicable to the oh. family context and um, I haven't noticed a lot of, a lot of people that have really gone hey let's 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 really niche this for the family. Um, yeah. it's, the, the family help is usually like, oh, dad's an alcoholic and mom's about to go into rehab and we're in crisis mode. Right. Um, whereas it's so great to talk to someone that's like, Hey, let's, let's, let's go from good to great. Let's, let's, you know what I mean? Um, yeah. You know, let's, let's, let's intentionally choose to have deeper connection with the people in our life that are the most important, right? Yeah. Not that the people at work aren't important and they're very important. It's good to have a good right. flow, but if, if that's true for your people you work with in your team that you lead, it's exponentially more true for your your mother, your son, your daughter, your, your extended family. Yeah, I think what I think what what naturally occurs for some of us, I can't speak for other coaches, but for me especially, it was true. Is that if, if I can if I can do this work and I can apply this these principles, which apply to everyone for every situation, love and connection, and relationship, you know, that kind of thing. If I can use that to help clients create success, then I can earn a few hundred thousand dollars a year, which gives me the opportunity to go fly to Chelmsford, England, take a week and do a TED talk where I don't get paid to drop $10,000 in writing a book uh, and put it on Amazon to make that happen for, for me to say, you know what? I don't need to be working this morning. I can spend some time with David and we can talk about this. Mm-hmm. So it's the, the business that provides the opportunity for me to make enough money to be able to take a lot more time and focus on the, the general population, which yep. is the ultimate end goal anyway. It's, mm-hmm. it's helping people find meaning in their life to transform their relationships to where they feel joy. That's what the whole Holy Grail is. But it's difficult for me to go out and say, hey, I'd like to support myself and my family. And so single mom, could you, you know, could you pay me a few hundred, yeah. a few hundred dollars so I can, you know, help yeah. you? No. It's, it's, I, you know, it's, it's very applicable to what we do because, you know, we're selling people bunkies, right? And there's a certain profit involved in that. Um, it's, yeah. a, it's a great business. Um, but if that's the vehicle that we need to take to ultimately drive people to deeper and more sustained, meaningful connection with the people that that's what we're going to do. Right. Yeah. Um, but that's the, the old, that's the ultimate goal for you and I is making a difference in people's lives. We just have to go through the business realm to be able to make enough money to be able to go do this. Yeah. This is our goal. Yeah. That's a, I've never put it so articulately, heard it put so articulately, but that's uh, when I really think about it. Yeah, absolutely. Oh. So it's cool. Great. I think that's a great uh, to cap the conversation and, and thank you so much for your time. So I would encourage everyone to thank check you. out more. Yeah. Thank you so much, David. It's been such an honor to be with you. I just, I just um, platonically professionally fell in love with you this time. You know, you're a great guy. <laughs> likewise. Likewise. Awesome. I really appreciate your time, Dan. So yeah, uh, we'll be in touch and, uh, and thanks so much for your time. Sounds great. Thank you, David. Take care. Yeah. Bye for now. Well, thank you so much for listening to this episode. I hope you've learned a lot, but beyond just mere intellectual entertainment, I hope it's changed the way you see relationships and inspired you to take action and make a connection with someone in your life today. Do it. I'd love to hear about it. And you can always email me directly at david at funkylife.com with the subject meaningful connection. Love to hear your stories. 